Hello. In this section of the tour of Drax Power Station, we're going to look at something called condensers. Now, you might not have heard of condensers before, don't worry about that, but you're probably familiar with the term condensation. You'll learn more about this in your science classes in school, but just by way of a quick recap. Condensation is an example of what's called a change of state and happens when a gas turns into a liquid by being cooled. The most common example of this is the way water in the atmosphere changes from a gas to a liquid when it comes into contact with a cold surface. Let's look at this a bit further. Think of a glass containing a cold drink on a warm summer's day. You'll notice that after a short time, moisture appears on the outside of the glass. We say that condensation has formed. What's happening is that some of the energy possessed by the water molecules in the air is transferred to the cooler molecules in the wall of the glass and the drink. Having lost this energy, the water molecules can no longer exist as a gas, so they turn into a liquid. Another thing you need to remember is that heat energy spontaneously flows from hot to cold. It's why people tell you to close doors in the winter because you're letting all the heat out. So, to recap, condensation is a change of state, specifically from a gas to a liquid, and heat spontaneously flows from hot to cold. I see, but what's this got to do with making electricity? Well, believe it or not, that everyday occurrence, which is so familiar to us, is crucial in getting your electric toaster to work. But to understand that, and how we got to where we are today, we need to go back in time a bit. Picture the scene if you can. It's 1760, and Britain is at the start of the Industrial Revolution. The work being done by animals and water mills is gradually being replaced by steam-powered engines. These were more powerful, could operate for longer periods, and they could be coupled to machinery such as pumps to stop water filling up a mine, or textile looms. These allowed the mass production of goods such as cotton clothing. It's fair to say that because of steam power, life would never be the same again. To operate these machines, coal was burnt, releasing its stored energy as heat. The heat was used to boil water to make steam, which in turn was used to drive some form of machinery. So far so good, yes? Having powered whatever piece of machinery you're using, you now need to pump the water back to the boiler so you can reheat it. It's a continuous cycle when the machines are operating. But, here's the problem. You haven't got water, you've got steam. And because you're an engineer, you also know that it's easier to pump water than steam. So you need to find a way of changing its state, i.e. turning it from a gas back into a liquid so you can pump it back to the boiler. Early engineers were able to do this, but not in ways that were overly efficient. This meant that early steam engines used lots of fuel. A big problem? Nah. Step forward Mr James Watt, engineer extraordinaire and he of the SI unit of power, and also on the back of the current £50 note. What? Really? No, what? Really. What's so special about what? Well, in 1765, the clever Mr. Watt worked out that if the steam power in a steam engine could be cooled in a chamber that was separate from the engine, then the efficiency was, quote, much improved, meaning that it used less fuel, so was more efficient. Basically, his idea allowed the machine, engine, thing doing the work to stay hot over here, whilst allowing the steam to be cooled over there. And if you were in the business of running a factory on steam power, then what's not to like about that? So pleased was Mr Watt with his separate condensation chamber, he took out a patent in 1769 on his snappily titled New Invented Method of Lessening the Consumption of Steam and Fuel in Fire Engines. He even decided to give it a catchy name. He called it a condenser. Result. So let's leap forward to today, but remember what we've said about the condenser. 
because even though we're moving forward over 200 years, it's still relevant. Trax power station is an example of what's known as a thermal process. It uses the stored energy in fuel, except that it uses a renewable wood fuel instead of coal, to produce heat. The heat is used to boil water to produce high pressure steam, which spins turbines. These drive the electrical generators that make the electricity we use. And just like Mr. Watt, Drax Power Station faces exactly the same challenge, i.e. how to turn steam back into water as efficiently as possible. So Drax uses separate condensation chambers. I can see why Mr. Watt knew that wouldn't catch on. Condensers to turn steam into water. But the main difference between Mr. Watt and power stations like Drax is one of scale. The condensers at Drax are massive and require huge volumes of water to operate efficiently. Nearly 850,000 litres are pumped through the condensing systems every minute when they're operating. Now realistically, you can't get that volume of water out of a tap, which explains why power stations tend to be located next to large rivers. Drax power station is located near the River Ouse in deepest Yorkshire and uses water from the river in the condensing process. How do the condensers work? Well, it's pretty straightforward, really. But before we come on to that, remember what we said earlier about heat energy spontaneously flowing from hot to cold. Our condensers are big metal boxes with thousands of metal tubes inside them. At Drax, each condenser has 10,500 tubes, making a total of 21,000 tubes per generating unit. When electricity is being generated, river water is pumped continuously through the tubes. And because the river water is cold, it cools the surfaces of the tubes inside the condenser. The hot steam enters the condenser and comes into contact with the cold tubes. This causes the steam to release its heat, and in doing so, it turns from a gas into water, i.e. it undergoes a change in state. The water is collected and can now be pumped back to the boiler for reheating. And just in case it isn't clear, the steam and the river water don't come into direct contact. The river water stays inside the tubes and the steam condenses on their outside surfaces. And just like we saw with the example of the warm air and the cold drink earlier, the heat from the steam passes through the walls of the tubes and into the river water flowing through them, suddenly turning it warm. The warm river water is sent to be cooled down and once cooled, it's pumped back to the condensers. When we make electricity, this heating and cooling process happens continuously. So there you have it. Something that's so familiar to all of us, it's critical to generating electricity. If you want to know more about how we cool down the river water, then have a look at our presentation on cooling towers. In the meantime, have a go at the following questions and see how much you can remember about condensers. Goodbye.